Go back here in the center. Wonderful music. Wonderful music. I love the song. Uh, first time I heard that song, Speak, O Lord, was from the Gettys um, at a concert that they did that song, and I think they just had written it at that time. And I thought, what a great song uh, to prepare hearts to receive the Word of God. And I trust that's what you want to do tonight. I am just a fallen and frail man, redeemed, um, washed in the blood of the Lamb, but yet imperfect and challenged in many ways. And so I come here standing before you, hoping to be a usable vessel in the hand of God to communicate the truth to you in such a way that it will have a direct impact on your life. Some of you, uh, I know, in looking across this audience, some of you remember a fellow named Art Linkletter, right? Uh, it goes back years and years. Um, it says that he had a TV show titled People Are Funny. Remember that? Uh, it ran for 19 years, from 19, the 1950s well into the 1960s. He also hosted a TV show titled House Party. I guess it was for about 25 years. Uh, old clips from Linkletter's House Party program were later featured in a segment that they created called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Some of you remember that. I thought that was pretty cool. The story is told that uh, Linkletter would frequently go to nursing homes uh, because he wanted to visit and to cheer up the people, the occupants of the nursing homes. And on one such visit, he was interacting with this lady who was sitting by herself. And she was looking out the window, and she seemed sort of totally unimpressed and totally indifferent to him as he would tell her jokes and he would give his best efforts to trying to cheer her up. And finally, in frustration, Link Letter said to the lady, Ma'am, do you know who I am? And she said to him, No, sir, I don't. But if you go to the front desk, they'll tell you. <laughs> I never thought I'd live in a day when identity would become controversial. But we live in a day because we have, as I told you in one of the messages, deserted objective truth. And now we have subjective ideas, truth for you, truth for me. And even our identity is not attached any longer to an objective truth. It's a subjective determination, a decision. When I was a young boy, if I ever walked up to my dad and said, Dad, I want to choose a different identity. I know where I would end up. <laughs> There's a lady I saw on television. Uh, no doubt on Fox News. Would you believe this? And this lady identifies as a wolf. And she was barking at the moon and growling and had wolf makeup on her and all that stuff, and obviously she's not a wolf. But we live in a day and age where if you made an assessment, a judgment, if you went up to her and said, ma'am, you need help, you would have been considered judgmental, unloving, harsh. That's the world that you and I live in. Matter of fact, in April 15th, that's coming up, I've decided because of this new movement on identity, I have decided that I'm going to tell the new 87,000 IRS agents that I identify as a non-taxpaying American citizen. <laughs> and if they say anything to me, I'm going to say, who are you to judge? <laughs> and after that, I'm going to start a prison ministry. So... Well, today I want to remind you that there is an identity marker that has been given to us. An identity 
that comes to us by way of the fact that we have a relationship with the living God. And I love this identity marker because it not only indicates the intimacy of the relationship that we have with the Lord, but it also says something about our eternal destiny. Now that is a good identity marker. And I'm speaking of the privilege of being described as in Christ. In Christ. And according to the Word of God, that is the best objective description that captures the essence of someone who has a saving relationship with Christ. They are described in that short descriptive title. Paul loves this title. In Christ. Genuine believers are identified in the New Testament in this way more than they are described as disciples of Christ. More than they're described as followers of Jesus. Overwhelmingly, especially with Paul, he describes every believer as being in Christ. You know, the term Christian is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Actually, it's been proven that that name did not come from the church. It was given to the church by people outside of the church. Christian, Christianos means of the party of Christ. And it was outsiders who assigned that meaning. But in the scripture, to be in Christ is a high privilege. To be in Christ is to be in the realm of the saved. To be in Christ is to be a possessor of eternal life. To be in Christ means that you have been forgiven your sins, past, present, and future. To be in Christ means you're a part of the body of Christ. To be in Christ means that you're an adopted child. All of that, all of that package, if you will, is captured in that title, in Christ. I think I found Paul using it 164 times. 164 times. The Apostle Peter, he wrote about being in Christ is amazing. This is what he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has been granted to us in all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. In other words, you have everything you need for life, not only this life, to live an abundant life, but you have eternal life, and you have everything you need to be godly. Now, what does it mean to be godly? To be godly is to emulate the character of your Father. That's what it means to be godly. It means to outwardly demonstrate the depth of your devotion to the God that you claim to be your father and the God you say you love. So it's godliness. And godliness is something you take with you to every arena of life, no matter where you go. There's, no, there's just not just a godliness for the church community. It's a godliness in your community. It's a godliness at work. It's a godliness in your family. And all of that's wrapped up. All of that is collectively gathered in that title, in Christ. And the amazing thing, I told you at the beginning of the message, this is not an identity that you've chosen for yourself. It's an identity that God has selected for you. I want to show you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you've got a Bible, or turn on your Bible if you have a, you know, some kind of device. I'm, I've got some guys in my church because so many of my young people um, have, you know, devices now that they look at their Bibles, and I got a guy working on a device that gives the sound of the turning of pages, because I miss that. You know, back in the day when I would say turn, and I'd hear all these pages ruffling, and I love it. So he's working on it. He said he's going to work on an app that you could buy that would, when you look at a passage, it'll make the sound of turning pages. So I can't wait. I would love to see that. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 26, I'll begin there. He says, um, 
For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many of you wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Now watch this. But by whose doing? His doing, you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So you have an identity in which God is to be honored because he has given that identity to you. It's a privilege to be described in this fashion. And God wants his children to be known as in Christ. You know, when he mentions there in verse 26, for consider your calling. Uh, in scripture and theology, they describe that as the effectual call. That is the divine summons issued in the context of the proclamation of the gospel message. And that calling overcomes the deadness of your human soul and the resistance to God that it produces. And it grants to you both repentance and faith necessary for you to exercise so that you might be saved. So you have a privilege, my brothers and sisters, to be in Christ. I was speaking with a young man, and he was not from our church, but was in a conversation with him, and he said, what's your perspective on homosexuality? So I, I told you earlier today that my source authority for what I believe is the Scripture, so I said, well, let me just take you through what the Scripture says. And when I was done, he said, well, then you're homophobic. And I said, no, I'm theophobic. He said, what does that mean? I said, I fear God. That's what it means. And I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. That's a beautiful, beautiful title to possess. And so this evening what I wanted to do is take you through some spiritual benefits, at least five of them, that the Bible describes for those who are in Christ, that these, these spiritual benefits belong to them. And the first one on your outline, I think you have a fill in there, right? So you have to remind me because my A personality people, Where, where's that fill in? Where is it? I can't go home unless you get it to me. So I want to make sure you get it. The first one, in Christ, you experience transformation. It's the first word. In Christ, you experience transformation transformation. If you take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we were looking at that verse way at the beginning of the week, and perhaps you didn't catch this, so I want to make sure you do. He says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Paul does, he says, therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. He is literally a new creation. We have in here new creature, but he basically means you're a brand new creation. Remember I told you the reason he does that is because now you have gone from spiritual death to spiritual life. Uh, now you have gone from what you used to be, your former days, and the actions and the behavior of your life that correlated with being lost. But now you have a behavior that reflects you being in Christ, and that you have life. And he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. The old things passed away. That's everything you were before you were in Christ. They're passing away. And the verb tense kind of suggests a process, that as you're progressing in sanctification, more and more of the old stuff is unearthed found out and cast aside the old things that you were when you were dead, when you did not know Christ, 
when you were out of Christ, not in Christ. And then he says, and behold, new things have come. New things. What kind of new things? This new passion to know God's Word. Because the Spirit of God has come into you. When you become a believer, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about this. When you become a believer, the Spirit of God comes into you and enables you. He illuminates your heart and your mind to a comprehension of what the Spirit of God has inspired. So that's new. You have a new value for being with the people of God. You have a brand new value for worshiping the Lord. You have a, a brand new value for getting the Word of God into your heart and into your mind and fleshed out into your life. I could have never imagined when I was lost of getting up early on a Sunday morning to go to church. That was never on my agenda. Now I practically live there. New things come. New practices, new behaviors, new things that reflect um, the fact that you are in Christ. You have love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a wonderful thing. That's a new thing that has come. And why has it come to you? Because of your identity. Where would you get your identity? From God. What is your identity? Let's say it together. In Christ. And it's because of what God has done in your life that you have that great privilege and that great benefit. Let's talk about the second benefit. In Christ, you experience liberation. So in Christ, you have transformation. You're made into a new creature. You're different. You're not, remember what I told you? It's not perfection. It's new direction with brand new values that correlate with the new direction of your life. It's not when you become in Christ, you don't become morally perfect and spiritually completely mature just because you're in Christ. You've got to work at those things. But you do not become perfect. I wish that if we came to know Christ, that that bent, that flesh, that fallen humanness would be put to death and it would never impact you again or me. But you know that's not the case. By the way, let me remind you of something. Your battle with sin is proof that you're in Christ. The unsaved don't know that battle. It's only the saved. This passage came to mind. I'm going to show it to you. Look in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This is always dangerous because this was not in my notes, but I, I want to give it to you. 516. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That word walk means the order of one's behavior or one's conduct. Order your behavior according to the prompting of the Spirit, which would be through the Word of God. And he says, if you do that, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. But then he says, in the very next verse, 17, for the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So every one of your moral and ethical decisions are challenged by your fallen base nature that wants you to pursue what you want in your fallen humanness and the Spirit of God who resides in you and desires for you to function in accordance with the will of God. This is the battle. And it's not the absence of this battle that proves you belong to Christ. It's the presence of the battle. I know you probably didn't think about that, but your fight with sin is proof you're in Christ. <laughs> Does that make you happy? I don't know if it makes you happy, but it, it kind of excites me because I'm battling with sin all the time. 
And every once in a while, I fall into sin. I think I've done that twice this year. No. <laughs> I think I just did it now. <laughs> but in Christ, you have liberation. You and I have just gone through this terrible COVID thing, haven't we? And everyone was worried about this virus. And uh, we were concerned. And actually, uh, there was a period of time in, uh, I think it was a, uh, two-month period of time that I did 13 funerals. Uh, only one was COVID-related, but it was amazing to me what was going on in our world at the time, and never in my ministry history that I had to do so many funerals in such a short period of time. It was almost one right after another, or two weeks would go by and another one would come by, and it was just an amazing time. It, all that bleak stuff was going on, but did you know that there is a virus that's Far worse. COVID, some people had, not everyone, right? But there's a virus that is far, far more reaching. It's called the sin virus. And every person on planet Earth has been afflicted with this virus. All of the offspring of Adam come into this world with the virus intact. It is that bent, it is that proclivity that draws you away to sin and rebellion. It's universal. It's been here since Adam fell into sin, and it's going to be here even through the millennium. Even when Christ reigns on the earth for a thousand years, there will still be people who have the sin virus. It won't be done away with until we believers enter into the new heaven and the new earth and we get those. Remember that brand new body I'm so excited about? I keep on thinking. I'm actually designing my new body on paper currently. <laughs> and uh, so, but in any event, that's when we get the freedom from the sin virus. But there is a liberation that you currently have, and that is found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. No condemnation. I don't know about you. I know myself, and I know the vile sinfulness that I have been involved in over my lifetime. And when I read a passage like that, that because of the blood of Christ, that was the currency that he paid for our redemption. I look forward now to Christ coming for his church. And I look forward to meeting my heavenly father but neither Christ nor my Heavenly Father will take me and bring me to judgment that leads to condemnation. Because I'm in Christ, and I want you to get this, because I am in Christ, it's important that you keep this in mind. You are not only saved by God, you have been saved from God. from the wrath that he will exercise in that time of universal judgment. You have been liberated from a destiny of eternal damnation in the lake of fire. Now, does that ring your bell? Because of what Jesus did and your repentance and your faith in that saving work of Christ and his resurrection from the dead... You are now in Christ and you are free from condemnation. Romans chapter 5. Just look there with me for a second, please. Romans chapter 5. In verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love toward us 
in that while we were sinners, yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what I love about that? Jesus didn't wait for us to get reformed, to fix ourselves up. He died in our place while we were irreverent and fully engaged in disobedience and sin. And yet because of his great love, he went to the cross and died in our behalf. And so verse 9, it says, And much more than having now been justified, being declared right standing with God by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. (laughs) That's what it means, no condemnation. That righteous wrath when God expresses his settled anger toward sinners. I was going through the book of Revelation, and Revelation 21 gives a list of people that will spend forever in the lake of fire. They are the subjects of the wrath of Christ. And the thing that's missing from their life is that they are not in Christ. That hurts my heart because there's a lot of people I know that if they don't come to Christ, I know that's their destiny. I don't know about you, but that haunts me. I want everybody to be in Christ because there's no condemnation in Christ. And there's transformation in Christ. Now let's take a look at the third benefit. In Christ, you experience reconciliation. This is an amazing truth. The word reconciliation in the original language was used um, in the exchange of money. You know, like if you take a Canadian dollar versus an American dollar and you make an exchange. That's what used to primarily refer to it. But metaphorically, relationally, it means to take a relationship that was out of order and bring it back to order. And so in Christ, you have been reconciled to God. In other words, your relationship was way out of order because you were a wretched sinner. You were separated from him. And you would have been separated forever if he didn't intervene. But because of Christ and because of the shed blood of Christ, you are now reconciled to him. And guess what else? You are now reconciled to everybody else who's been reconciled. Do you understand? In the church, you are reconciled to everybody. Now, I know today there's a great deal of discussion about you know, racial tension and racial reconciliation. And really, once again, the Bible screams out the answer. It said when people are in Christ and they're reconciled to God, they are also reconciled to all kinds of different people throughout the world, different skin colors, different national origins, and they're all in Christ In uh, Revelation chapter 5, you get a glimpse of the people in heaven. And guess what it says about the people in heaven? It says that they come from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Matter of fact, one of the purposes of the cross work of Christ was to bring people who were formerly estranged from each other into one new man called the church. That's why partiality and racism in a church is acting contrary to the cross work of Christ. Because you and I all stand level at the foot of the cross. Paul went out of his way to make that point. He told the Galatians, let's see if I can find that for you in Galatians Chapter 3, I believe, in verse 28, he said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. So you want to bring about reconciliation in our world, and I know that there's a lot of people that say there's 
ways that we can do that. We need to make laws against racism. I'm not opposed to that. Racism is an ugly sin. It's what it is. It's, it's, it's once again not respecting what the Bible says. Because the Bible says, how many people are made in his image? All people. And by the way, you know how many races are found in the Bible? One. The human race. And Christ died for that. And so when we start dividing in the church, it is in strong opposition to the redemptive work of Christ because the redemptive work of Christ was to bring us all together. No human organization has ever been able to do that. We have the United Nation. Remember after World War II, what was that designed to do? To bring us all together. They are all together in their hatred for America and Israel. So they are united. <laughs> but the shed blood of Christ... He brings people together. Paul told that to the Ephesians. I want you to look in Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to look at, oh, let's see, Ephesians chapter 2, and let's begin at verse 11. He's talking to the Gentiles, the Gentiles in the city of Ephesus, and he wants to make a very important point to them. Uh, you remember the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles? They had sanctioned segregation. They believed that the Bible taught the Jewish people not to have anything to do with Gentile people. Now, the Lord did tell the nation of Israel that when they went into Canaan land, they were not to get involved in unholy alliances with the people of that nation. They were not to give their sons and daughters to them because of their religious devotion to idolatry. And the quickest way to apostasy is through committed relationships, marriage or otherwise. And the Lord knew that. And so he told them, listen, don't learn their ways. Don't take up their habits. That's not for you. But then in the body of Christ, it's always been the plan of God to make one new man that includes Jews and Gentiles and everybody else. And so Paul wants to make this clear to these Gentiles. He tells them in verse 11, Therefore, remember the former, formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. That was a derogatory title. You are the uncircumcised. In verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, here we go, you were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who have made both groups into one and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall. This is an amazing thing. In the Jews in the first century, if they even went near a Gentile, let alone spoke their name, they would spit in a derogatory fashion. They'd wash the sandals off if they walked into a Gentile land. There was hostility. There was prejudice. There was segregation. But now in the blood of Christ, they were to be brought together. And then he says in verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is in the law of commandments and contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having it put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far away 
and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have one access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. You Gentiles, along with the Jews, are the household of God. You have been reconciled to God, and now you can be reconciled to each other. You remember when Peter went to the household providentially, he went to the household of Cornelius, a Gentile, because God led him in that direction, right? And remember what happened? He began to preach the gospel to these Gentile people, and an amazing thing happened. Peter says, you know what happened? They received the Spirit of God just as we did at first. What he was saying is, remember, we received the indwelling of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which was evidence of our conversion. It was evidence of being in Christ. And guess what? The Gentiles received the same Spirit. His Jewish friends were very angry with him when he got back to Jerusalem. And he gave this report to them from Acts chapter 11, 15 through 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning, on the day of Pentecost. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how we used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he has given to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? In God's way. And when they heard this, his Jewish brothers from Jerusalem, when they heard this, they quieted down and they glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted, dekoa, gave as a gift to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. The same life that we have in Christ, they have in Christ. And so in the body of Christ, if you want reconciliation, not only to God, which you have in Christ, but in reconciliation to others who have reconciliation with God. You demonstrate that the cross work of Christ was extremely effective in doing something that no other social institution has ever been able to do. And that is to take people who are formerly estranged and make them into one body. Currently, I love... When I'm at New Community Church, I I love looking in the church at my black brothers and sisters and my Asian brothers and sisters and some brothers and sisters who I'm not sure where they're from because that's a little bit of what heaven looks like, right? Let me read that passage to you from Revelation 5. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. If you are ever in a church where somebody is demonstrating a prejudice toward a particular person because of their origin or any of that sort of thing. You need to point it out. That's sin. That's operating against the cross work of Christ. You are never to stand in opposition to a thing he's trying to accomplish. He's trying to show the world, look at what the gospel does. Look at what the gospel does. It takes people who are naturally hostile 
and makes them loving brothers and sisters. Look at what the gospel does. Look at what happens when people are in Christ. So that's another benefit we get. Number four, in Christ, there's two things you need to fill out here. In Christ, you experience the blessings of salvation. The blessings of salvation. I want you to look in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is one run-on sentence. I wish I would have known that when I was 11 years old and in the classroom with Sister Phoebe, otherwise known as Sister Ratchet. Because she would beat me over the head for run-on sentences. If I would have known this, I would have said, you know what? The Apostle Paul wrote run-on sentences. This is one continuous sentence. Blessed be the God, verse 3, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where, folks? In Christ. Every spiritual treasure, every spiritual treasure is yours in Christ. And then he begins to name some of these things. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Stop there because there is a period. I wish they would put that in love and the beginning and the next verse, but they don't always do that. You know that there's no periods or exclamation in the Greek language. That's why. And so, but anyways, that's, I wish that, I don't know why I'm telling you that. This is just ranting here at this mic. But did you notice in in verse 4, he says, you've been chosen, ek legomai, uh, to be selected out from several alternatives. That's what it means, to be selected out from several alternatives. Now notice the source of your election in verse 4. He chose us. Do you see that? And then next of all, learn, look at the sphere of our election. The source, he chose us, the sphere in him. And notice the time of the election before the foundation of the world. And notice the purpose of the election, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless describes your glorification. So before the foundation of the earth, you who are in Christ, not only were chosen, but your destiny was established that you would be conformed to the image of a son, that's glorification. That's what happens in the eternal state. That is one nice spiritual blessing. (laughs) He doesn't stop there. In love, last part of verse 4 into verse 5, he predestined us, To predestine is to set out a horizon or a boundary or an objective. That's what it means. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of whose will? His will. Uh, You have been adopted by God into his family. You You could not be in God's family naturally. You say, how come? Because naturally you were a sinner. So God, through the blood of Christ, adopts you. And in that adoption, you have been given the place or the privilege of a firstborn son with all the rights and the privileges of a firstborn son. That's a great spiritual treasure, isn't it? And then he goes on after that. In verse 7, in him we have redemption. We have redemption. 
He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption, what a powerful word. It actually is, comes from a Greek word, agarago, which means like to purchase something out of a marketplace. But when we're talking about redemption theologically, we're talking about buying one's freedom by paying a debt that was beyond their ability to pay. They were enslaved by a debt, and it was impossible for them to pay it. And Christ, through the currency of his own blood, paid your moral sin debt in full. So you have been set free from the marketplace of sin. And I'm about to get charismatic here in a minute. But I'll calm down. That excites me. I've been redeemed. We sing about that. And I've been forgiven. Do you know what it means to be forgiven? It is to be released from a debt that could be justly extracted from you. To be released from a debt that could be justly extracted from you. You owe God a major debt of sin. Moral debt. But in Christ, you have been forgiven of all of that. Your debt has been paid in full. I don't know about you, but do you think that's a great spiritual rich, riches to have in Christ? I don't know if that excites you, excites me. I, I, I think Christians ought to be the happiest people on planet Earth. When I come across my brothers and sisters and they say, I say to them, how are you doing? Well, under the circumstances I'm doing well. I always want to say, what are you doing under there? Get out! You've been forgiven. What would you think if you went to your bank to pay your mortgage payment and they said, you know what? We don't need your mortgage payment. Someone came in and paid the whole thing off. Would that be a good day or what? <laughs> Acts 10.43 says, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Well, there's more. But for the sake of time, I'm going to bring you down to 13 and 14. He says in that, in chapter 1, In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. I rejoice at that statement. And everybody's fighting over whether there's truth. There's truth. As a matter of fact, the gospel message is truth. It's the truth about how God has redeemed people through the redemptive work of his son, on the cross and his victorious resurrection. In him, after you listen to that message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The seal marks you out not only as God's uh, property, but it also marks you out as being protected by God. For what? Well, it says, it tells you what it is after that. It says, in, in him you were sealed, in verse 14, who is given, the Holy Spirit, who is given as literally a down payment of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So you have a down payment. What's the down payment? The sealing, the indwelling, the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And that is a promise of more to come. Because you're in Christ. Once again, that's very exciting news to me. That I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, let's take a look at the final, the final blessing. In Christ, and here's your final fill-in for my type A personalities. Here it goes, folks. Wouldn't it be something if I just stopped right now? <laughs> In Christ, you experience completion. Completion. In Christ. 
Um, if you take a look in Colossians chapter 2. In verse 6, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Now watch this one. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy an empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in a bodily form. So in other words, Christ is fully God and fully man. The completeness of deity found in a bodily form. And then he says in verse 10, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. You are complete in Christ. What does that mean? That means that no false teacher should ever, ever be given a listening ear to their teaching that generally is a works-based teaching, tells you something you have to do because you have everything you need in Christ. You're complete. You've got eternal life. You've got a destiny that is certain. I don't need to pay attention to secular humanism. There's nothing there for me. I am complete in Christ. Everything I need, I have in Christ. And therefore, I need nothing else. Nothing is missing. Christ fills you up. There ain't any other spiritual treasures or spiritual benefits or your personal merit can secure in any sense any more additional things. Just like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. So false teachers who come along and tell you this is what you have to do, this is what you must do, always telling you something to do, they should not get a, a listening ear from those who are complete in Christ. That, that, just stop and think about it. Just some of the things I've said over this week. The moment you come to Christ... You are placed in Christ. The moment you come to Christ, the Spirit of God comes into you. And he imparts to you eternal life. And he enables you to live the Christian life. And he empowers you and he gives you gifts so that you can function in the service of the body of Christ. The greatest court there is, and that is the courtroom of God, you have been declared right standing with God because of the blood of Christ. You become adopted. You are now a child of the King. You have been forgiven. We mentioned that. You have been redeemed. We mentioned that. You have been placed into the body of Christ. Let me ask you this question. What is left to work for? What are you missing? You're complete in Christ. In our world, there's really only two religious systems. Only two. One would be characterized or put in the category of do. It's all the religious systems that tell you you have to do things to get right with your God or the gods or to become at one with the one. All of that do. Do. It's only biblical Christianity, the only one in that column, and the top of the column reads, done. It's been done for you. So, you are complete in Christ. Now, let me ask you, is that a great identity marker or what? 
in Christ. And I love that because I didn't need to choose it. You didn't need to choose it. God graciously gave that to you. And because I am in Christ, now here's my challenge for you. I need to live like that. People need to know that I am in Christ by the way I act, my behavior. I think one of the things that is horrific to being in Christ is hypocrisy. Acting contrary to your identity. And so the challenge that I have for you today is, okay, what a great privilege. Now act like you own it. You understand? Act like this is true. Matter of fact, you don't have to act. It should be the natural response of anyone who's in Christ because you've been put there. I'm, I'm so excited about it. You know, I haven't done a lot of preaching in the last year at such other churches and uh, because now we have a, a new young pastor that preaches at my church, which is great. It's by design. It's what I wanted because I wanted my church to have a future. I didn't want it to be a one-generational thing. And so uh, I was there to make sure he got it. But, you know, in doing this preaching all week, I'm very excited. Would you mind staying for another week? I've got some more. <laughs> Pat, can they stay for free? We'll just... Is he, okay, yeah. <laughs> Well, there goes any honorarium that I had. It's gone right there. No, I just love the fact that we're having this chance to do that. So I'm unloading on you is what's happening. Um, all the different things that I've had to study and, and such. And so I trust that they have been helpful. We've got one more to give you tomorrow. So come with seat belts tomorrow. All right, let's pray together. Well, gracious Heavenly Father, what a great joy to be able to communicate the truth to these dear people and to communicate it in such a fashion that it helps them to grow closer to you. It helps them to act as if they are in Christ because they are. And Lord, help them to demonstrate to their family members, their friends, their co-workers, their neighbors, the difference that make you make in their life because they are in Christ. Thank you for their listening ears today and their hearts that have been opened for the implanting of truth. Thank you for that. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to do it today. There's a benediction at the end of the book of Jude. And uh, I'd like to close our time with that benediction. If I could find the book of Jude. It's in the New Testament, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here it is. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord to the glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore and all God's people said Amen. Amen. Have a great night. Thank you mom. <laughs>